Okay. Welcome everybody to today's technical seminar titled Impacts of Air Pollution on Gene Expression Changes in the Elderly with Cardiovascular Disease, which will be presented by Dr. Ralph J. Delfino. I'm Nargis Sherin, the manager for this contract, and this study is part of the research division's ongoing investigation of the adverse impacts of air pollution in vulnerable populations in California. Many of the ARB's regulatory programs are designed to reduce particulate matter pollution because of its impact on public health, such as worsening of cardiovascular or heart disease. Also, ARB's research program has funded a number of studies which investigated the health impacts of particulate matter pollution to help clarify the relationship between particulate matter exposure and cardiovascular health effects that we observe. For example, ARB funded research studies showed that long-term exposure to particulate air pollution was associated with mortality from heart disease and new cases of stroke in elderly female teachers and with heart disease mortality in elderly men and women in California. Although particulate matter exposure is consistently associated with adverse cardiovascular health effects, the exact mechanism leading to these effects are not well understood. However, recent investigations, some funded by ARB, have revealed potential mechanisms for these cardiovascular health effects, which involve increases in oxidative stress and inflammation, coagulation, changes in vascular function, and changes in gene expression. With that background, the study that you will hear about today used a genetic approach to shed light on the PM-related pathways and mechanisms that drive changes in cardiovascular health. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker for this seminar, Dr. Delfino. Dr. Delfino is a professor and vice chair for research and graduate studies, Department of Epidemiology, UC Irvine and is Associate Director of the Genetic Epidemiology Research Institute, UC Irvine. Dr. Delfino's research and teaching focus over the past 30 years has been in environmental epidemiology. Please help me welcome Dr. Delfino. Okay. Thank you very much. So the topic of my talk today is on a study looking at the relationship between uh, gene expression and air pollution exposures in a cohort panel of individuals, elderly individuals with coronary artery disease. So this is the outline of the uh, talk. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about background and rationale of the study and then go on to the actual uh, tasks that were accomplished. So there's been a very uh, long-term uh, investigation of the relationship between hospital morbidity, mortality, and air pollution. Um, in the early days when I started out, it was focused on respiratory outcomes. Um, and then our attention turned to cardiovascular outcomes. Um, so as was previously mentioned, uh, we've observed uh, death from myocardial infarction, uh, stroke, and other uh, adverse cardiovascular outcomes um, related to increases in PM2.5 and PM10. So out of those studies, a lot of questions emerged, which was, well, when you're looking at particle mass, mass is a mixture of all kinds of components which vary across space and time. So then what are the, what are the components, what are the sources, um, that are responsible for these associations. Because some of the, some of the uh, components of particle mass really aren't that toxic at all. So, so that's been a big question. The other big question is looking, looking say, at fine particles at PM2.5. 
<coughs> is there a smaller fraction of PM2.5 that might be more toxic? And so the research that we've been involved in has been uh, focused a lot on ultrafine particles, uh, generally defined as less than 100 nanometers or 0.1 micrometers in diameter. Um, this is a cohort panel study, as I mentioned, uh, in elderly people. Uh, with a diagnosis of coronary artery disease. And the reason we picked that population is, is that we figured they would be more susceptible and that information has, in fact, come out of these uh, morbidity and mortality studies, the time series studies of hospital admissions. And we looked to see whether uh, exposure to markers of traffic-related pollution or combustion-related pollution, as well as quasi-ultrafine particles, what we measured was less than 0.25 micrometers, um, was positively associated with different outcomes. And uh, in the last uh, five or six years uh, for this study, we have reported positive associations of these exposures with plasma biomarkers of systemic inflammation, platelet activation, which of course would lead to thrombosis, increased blood pressure, electrocardiographic ST segment depression, which is an indicator of cardiac ischemia, and ventricular tachycardia. All of these outcomes and all these associations were observed in the same population, the population that I'm going to be discussing today. So then we, out of, out of, those, um, out of those findings, uh, questions emerged um, about, again, you know, what are, the, uh, what are the mechanisms behind this? And in epidemiology, even though we don't really study mechanisms per se, the things that we uh, look at can be clues to mechanisms that can then be studied in experimental models. So we wondered whether we could observe changes in the expression of genes, genes that code for proteins, uh, particularly proteins uh, that might be behind some of our, our uh, uh, findings of plasma proteins. Uh, and at the bottom here are listed um, the, the publications. I'm going to use this arrow for the mouse. Uh, the publications from this, this study um, uh, reporting uh, all of these outcomes. So then we looked into the literature, uh, and it's mostly an experimental lit literature using in vitro cell culture and in, in vivo animal models that have shown that air pollutants, particularly diesel exhaust and ultrafine particles concentrated from urban air, uh, can induce gene expression uh, changes um, in these models. And usually those changes are in biopathways uh, representing uh, antioxidant response, inflammation, coagulation, endothelial function, uh, as well as endoplasmic reticulum stress, which is uh, unfolded po protein responses um, that occur uh, pro most likely at higher concentrations um, because um, some, of the, some of the unfolded protein responses are to, to drive the cell towards uh, apoptosis or cell death. But there's very little information on gene expression in human populations, whether air pollutants um, induce gene expression. There's a little bit, um, but, but not a lot. So we felt it was time for us to, to produce some of this data. In this study, we hypothesized that expression of 35 candidate genes in biological pathways relevant to cardiovascular responses, the ones we had already observed, would be altered in subjects following air pollutant exposures that are linked to products of fossil fuel combustion. So now for the tasks. So there are two uh, exposure assessment tasks. Task one uh, was to conduct a chemical, chemical speciation of organic components in the accumulation mode uh, of, of uh, PM2.5. Uh, and these filters had been collected previously in, in the Cardiovascular Health and Air Pollution Study, abbreviated here CHAPS really CHAPS-1 because we're now doing CHAPS-2. So in CHAPS-1, we followed uh, these subjects for 47 weeks. And every week, uh, we collect collected these uh, filters. So that was the first task. Um, we had already actually um, done the composition measurements in quasi-ultrafine particles. So this remained. And we wanted to get a full picture of the, of the com composition, the organic composition in particular, of, of PM2.5 in total. Um, this was done at the University of Wisconsin under uh, Jamie Shower, James Shower. Task two, uh, done at the University of Southern California under Dr. Constantinos Ciotas, was to use that data and combine it with existing data that we already had from CHAPS-1 on metals and on the quasi-ultrafine particles uh, to conduct an exposure analysis and source apportionment 
uh, using chemical mass balance models. So the third task, uh, which is our task at UCI, uh, was an epidemiologic analysis of the relation between gene expression and exposure to air pollutants, including particle mass by size, components, and source tracers. And this is using data from tasks one and two. Um, so we selected these genes a priori, the, the 35 genes, and we selected them from the experimental data primarily. Now the expression work had already been done uh, under another NIEHS funded project. Um, so these 35 genes are involved in the pathways of interest, oxidative stress, inflammation, thrombosis, xenobiotic response, um, coagulation, as well as uh, this endoplasmic reticulum stress response. So now the parent study, this is CHAPS-1 um, that I told you about. I'm going to um, give you some information about the methods and measurements that uh, were involved in that study. Um, so again, this was uh, funded, it was a combination of funding from NIH, NIEHS, uh, ARB as well uh, funded, funded that study, not, not just this present study, and AQMD. And uh, we were also part of the uh, EPA PM Center at UCLA. So the design of the study is a cohort panel study. So this involves repeated measures and subjects of both exposures and outcomes over time. So it's like a regular cohort study, only the repeated measures are done um, in a more compressed fashion on a daily or weekly basis. Um, and then um, what we had from that study, again, as I said, is we had the uh, quasi-ultrafine particle data, PM 0.25. And this was available to supplement uh, the accumulation mode data that was going to be generated from the present study in task one to two. Um, so we had the foresight during CHAPS-1 to actually go ahead and collect the blood in uh, packed gene RNA tubes. So these are tubes with, with a special formulation that stabilizes the, the RNA. Uh, and, and we put them in a minus 80 freezer and saved them until uh, this study so we could do gene expression work. Um, so the study population are elderly people with a history, uh, confirmed history of coronary artery disease. All the subjects had to be non-smokers and not exposed to passive smoke. Um, in the present study, now we, uh, these were all people from retirement communities. We followed uh, people in four retirement communities. Uh, the present study, we selected three of these four retirement communities for a couple of reasons, uh, primarily cost, because this is very, it's very expensive to do this uh, gene expression work, and also because um, three of the communities were in the San Gabriel Valley, so they were kind of in the same airshed. The fourth community was in Riverside, so it was very, very different. Uh, not very, very different, but just very different. Um, and it was not, not in uh, uh, Riverside City proper, but it was actually downwind, uh, sort of downwind of a lot of agricultural areas. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of different kinds of aerosols out there. So we thought, you know, if we're gonna, if we're gonna cut costs, we're gonna limit it to these three communities that are closer to, uh, closer to, to the urban area of Los Angeles. And so, um, with, so more direct exposure to primary combustion aerosols. Um, so in that study, um, just, just very briefly, some of the other things that we did is we did blood draws for plasma biomarkers. We did uh, excel nitric oxide as a biomarker of airway inflammation. And then nested in that study, we had a huge ambulatory follow-up where subjects wore uh, halter EKGs for a total of 10 days, as well as ambulatory hourly blood pressure monitoring. And so we've, we've published on, on all those, and I've given you the references above. So this is, um, this is kind of, basically, um, all of this is what we've measured uh, in, in that study so far in CHAPS-1. And um, this kind of points to some of the hypothesized pathways. <clears throat> so this is short-term exposure. So short-term exposure, acute responses. Um, so we focused on the, the source origin of particles, source composition, uh, with, with a keen eye on primary organic aerosols and secondary organic aerosols. Uh, size fraction, again, uh, quasi-ultrafine accumulation and coarse mode. Um, so our hypothesis is kind of uh, from the point of view that, that 
that, that the important components in particles are redox active. In other words, they have the capacity in the body to generate oxidative stress and other effects, of course. And, and oxidative stress can be tied to inflammatory responses um, and, other, and other responses that uh, we should be able to capture in this gene expression data. A lot of the gene expression data is, is in a way, it's, it's, an, it's an easier and more valid way to look at responses than trying to, to find the proteins that are expressed. It's a little bit more difficult to do that, and, uh, um, and some of the methods are actually uh, uh, more expensive than, than looking at gene expression. So all of these responses, systemic inflammation, thrombosis, and phase one, phase two uh, enzyme bio bioactivation and other oxidant res antioxidant responses were measured. Uh, we also measured uh, all of these acute responses that would be the sequelae of these uh, intermediate endpoints. Uh, so basically cardiovascular responses like increased blood pressure, decreased heart rate variability, autonomic dysfunction, um, and, um, and, other, and other outcomes like cardiac ischemia, which we measured looking at EKG, uh, ECG, uh, ST segment depression. Um, so what, the only thing we didn't look at, of course, is the, the real chronic outcome, which would be progression of, uh, chronic progression of atherosclerosis, which again is behind, you know, which is the sequelae of all these, um, uh, of all these uh, acute uh, processes. So these acute processes repeated over and over and over again over the years drives atherosclerosis. So this is the study flow chart. Um, I've highlighted in, in yellow the three regions in the San Gabriel Valley that are part of this gene expression study. Um, this was done in two different years. Um, uh, so the number of subjects is listed here. Again, this is repeated measures, so it's not a lot of subjects, but it's a lot of repeated measures. And each, uh, each subject was followed for six weeks in two different phases. So six weeks in a warm season, phase one. Six weeks in a warm season, phase two. And we did this uh, for, well, one practical reason was to give people a rest. It's hard to get your, your blood drunk 12 weeks in a row and, and all this other stuff. And the other thing is also to kind of to get a better, um, um, a better temporal uh, separation of particle components. So maybe more uh, secondary aerosols in the warm season and primary aerosols in the cooler season. This is characteristic of the subjects, 43 subjects. Very elderly, so average age is around 85 years. Um, so even, even though a lot of these people had heart attacks, as you can see um, here under cardiovascular history, 44%, bring the arrow here. So 44% of these subjects were diagnosed with CAD because they had a heart attack. And then this is, this is the hierarchical breakdown, essentially, of the other, uh, other conditions that allowed us to diagnose their condition, like a bypass graft, for example. Um, and as you would expect in a population like this, there were a lot of other cardiovascular diseases like congestive heart failure. You know, three quarters of them had hypertension, way more than half hypercholesterolemia, all the things you would expect uh, in, in a population like this. And on the, on the sorts of medications that you would also expect like statins and ACE inhibitors. So this is, uh, this is our air monitoring setup uh, in the outdoor, uh, in, at the outdoor sites of each community. We set up one of these trailers, which was provided by the Air Resources Board, the trailer was. Uh, AQMB helped with uh, some of the monitoring. USC um, did the rest of the measurement work. And um, <laughs> so th this was, um, it was just an amazing study because um, we were able to do everything on site. So you can see here uh, one, of our, one of our research staff in the, in the middle slide uh, who's working under a hood. It's the smallest, uh, it's the smallest biosafety hood we could find that would fit in the trailer so that we could draw the blood, process it immediately on site. We would actually draw the blood, mix it, put it on ice, bring it out to the trailer, and within a half hour we had it aliquoted and frozen. Um, the PAX gene tubes were frozen immediately on dry ice. So, so this was a way to prevent ex vivo changes um, in, in all the biomarkers that, that we looked at rather than you know, hauling it back to the lab and then you know, uh, taking all that time, uh, we decided that it was best to process everything right there. This is an example of the uh, indoor monitoring setup, which was also part of the study. This is just one of the communities. Um, so I want to give you now a, a summary of all the exposure measurements uh, that, that were done in the study. 
Uh, so we measure daily particle, uh, size fractionated particle mass concentrations. Um, again, quasi-ultrafine accumulation mode and coarse mode. <clears throat> and then the chemical composition was done on five days of filters. In other words, the five days uh, of filter collection prior to each weekly follow-up. Um, I should mention that each weekly follow-up was done on a Friday, specifically a Friday afternoon. Every subject had to come to our clinic, or it was actually an on-site clinic at the retirement community, had to come there at the same time of day. So this limited a circadian variation in the outcomes and day of week variation. So the five days before that, we were collecting filters. Now, because of particle mass loading uh, considerations, we had to composite those five filters, then extract the particles and do the composition analysis. So at the same time for, for seven, actually nine days, but we're just going to talk about seven days here, we had hourly uh, measurements going on. So PM 2.5 by BAM, total particle number concentration, which is considered you know, a surrogate of ultrafine particles because um, uh, the ultrafine particles are, or particle concentrations at the ultrafine range are, are the dominant size fraction of particle number concentration. Um, black carbon measured with an ethylometer, and we ran a Sunset Labs uh, machine to get elemental and organic carbon. And then, of course, there were uh, uh, measurements of EPA criteria air pollutants, uh, gaseous air pollutants, and meteorology. PM components. So the first um, sort of component, uh, it was a, really a surrogate method, was the EC tracer method. And uh, that method was published by Andrea Polidori uh, when he was at USC with uh, Dr. Ciotas. And it was a way, a really elegant way, of getting, getting at um, the two fractions of total organic carbon that were, one, attributable to primary sources and two, attributable secondary sources. So if you're interested in the method, uh, please, please see this, this interesting article. So we used that. And of course, uh, we also, in all three size fractions, uh, we had measurements of transition metals using ICPMS. And then we did filter extracts for the, uh, the two size fractions of PM2.5 for water-soluble organic carbon. And uh, filter extracts, of course, uh, for the organic uh, components measured by GCMS. So now uh, task one and two, methods and results. So the new air pollutant measurements done in task one were uh, to take those five uh, accumulation mode filters composite them and do the chemical analysis. So we measured, uh, Jamie Shower and group measured uh, more than 80 organic compounds using GCMS. The first primary one that we're most interested in is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is generally considered to be a marker of primary organic aerosols. And then uh, N-alkanoic or organic acids, which is considered to be a marker of secondary organic aerosols not necessarily uh, causally related to outcomes itself, but a, but a good marker nonetheless. Uh, same with hopanes. Hopanes are a tracer of primary vehicular aerosols, from which, which comes from uh, lubricant oils. And then finally, levoglucosan, which is a tracer of biomass burning. And we use that to adjust water-soluble organic carb compounds, carbon, excuse me, water-soluble organic carbon as an estimate of secondary organic aerosols. Because water-soluble uh, organic carbon comes from, generally speaking, from two sources, biomass burning and secondary organic aerosols. Um, they're water-soluble because they're oxidized. And so as we've proposed before, this is particularly important for airway responses because when these aerosols hit the airways, they're already pro-oxidant. So they're expected to have an effect in the airways quite immediately. Uh, whereas the primary aerosols, all of them like PAHs, need to be metabolized into their oxidant forms. And so that might not have an immediate effect in the airways, but, it, but since we know that chemicals like PAH are uh, absorbed and uh, uh, are found in the bloodstream and are found systemically as adducts of DNA and, and protein adducts, uh, that there's plenty of opportunity for, for those kinds of chemicals um, to have uh, systemic effects or cardiovascular effects. So the, the last thing we did, uh, and the next slide will describe that in great detail, is to come up with a measurement of PM oxidative potential. 
there are a number of different measurements. We couldn't do them all. This was the first one that we did. We've done in another study DTT. In the new study, we're also doing DTT. But this is a good one because I think because um, it's the it's the the, the PM oxidative potential um, that's measured in a biotic fashion rather than abiotic. Because the particle extracts are actually given in vitro to a culture of alveolar macrophages. And so that we can look at the response of the macrophages to the particle extract from week to week to week to week. So this is, this is the design and um, Martin Schaefer um, is the one who, who developed this assay and, and carried it out for us. Basically shows that um, we incubate the cells uh, with an extract, with the PM extract. In this case, we took uh, the extracts from quartz filters. The quasi-ultrafine extracts were done separately from the accumulation mode extracts. So we had, you know, not only the composition from those two size fractions, but also the PM oxidative potential from this uh, macrophage RS assay. So after incubating baiting, uh, the uh, cells uh, in the PM, uh, they were given this uh, reactive oxygen species probe, DCFHDA, and then uh, after some time, then the fluorescent intensity is measured, which is an indicator of the generation of reactive oxygen species by the macrophages, which are really quite good at doing that. Actually, one, that's one of their important jobs. Um, with respect to microorganisms. That's how they kill microorganisms to some extent. So task two uh, at USC was to uh, put together a chemical mass balance model for apportionment of total organic carbon. That was the EPA uh, model. Um, and samples from herbicide were excluded because they were affected by organic absorption artifacts. Um, that was actually after the fact, so it was fortunate for us it wasn't in the other communities because we didn't do gene expression work for Riverside anyway. Um, so some of the things I was telling you about that, that site when we decided not to use that site actually came out to be true here um, because the particles are, are quite different out there. So the focus in, in, this, in the chemical mass balance model was on PM2.5 by combining the two size fractions <coughs> in both the indoor and outdoor environments of all four retirement communities. So the chemical mass balance on three communities, um, the indoor-outdoor analysis on all four communities. So the main objective is to determine the degree to which indoor PM 2.5, out, excuse me, outdoor PM 2.5 infiltrates indoor. Important because people spend most of their time indoors. <clears throat> the second objective, to quantify the source contributions and identify major sources of PM 2.5 at both indoor and outdoor environments. And this is across both study years. So this is a list uh, of the different marker compounds that were used. Obviously, it's not all of the organic compounds. In the epidemiologic analysis, of course, we used all the PAH compounds, uh, whereas these were used because of their uh, ability to, um, to do the source apportionment. Um, also, uh, there was uh, what is called other water-soluble organic carbon. So that's uh, total water-soluble organic carbon. Um, minus the water-soluble organic carbon attributed to biomass burning. And that was estimated as 71% of the organic carbon apportioned to biomass from the chemical mass balance output. Chemical mass balance output uh, utilized levoglucosan, of course, as the tracer of biomass burning. Then we took that other water-soluble organic carbon, multiplied it by 1.8 to get, uh, which is the ratio of the micrograms of organic matter over the micrograms of organic carbon. So um, you, as you know, it's, um, there isn't any really good measure of secondary organic aerosols. So we use a number of different markers and tracers to sort of get at that. You know, and it's, it's very useful in the epidemiologic setting to use more than one way. You know, we have secondary organic carbon. We have this uh, chemical mass balance derived SOA, and we have organic or n aliphatic acids. So these are the results. Um, this is the average concentration of pH, total pHs. So this is, this is summing them all, uh, not just the CMB uh, uh, pHs, but all the pHs at the indoor and outdoor sampling sites during the two seasons. So indoors in blue, outdoors in, in red. And then we're separating the two seasons. This is the warm, warm phase, the first four, and then the cold phase. And uh, each of these uh, is for each of the communities. 
So there's a total of uh, um, eight six, weeks per six week periods, basically, with indoor and outdoor measurements. Um, so the first thing you can notice here is that indoor and outdoor are fairly close to each other. Concentrations aren't really that, that much higher in the outdoor environment than in the indoor environment. A little bit higher in, in, most, of the, uh, in most of the communities and phases. Um, the other thing to notice is that it's higher in the cold season. Again, you would expect this because of air stagnation. Air stagnation events, which are more co common in the, the cool season. Um, then the final thing to notice here is that G4 is Riverside. Recall, G4 is Riverside. G1 through 3 is the San Gabriel Valley. That's where, we did it. That's where we're doing our gene expression study. G4, the concentrations of pH, are lower than the rest of the communities. Again, uh, that's what you'd expect because the three San Gabriel communities are closer to the urban area of LA. So there's going to be more of this pH, which is uh, assumed to be from um, primary combustion uh, sources. So this, um, uh, so this next slide shows the, um, both correlation between indoor and outdoor specific pH components. I don't know if you can read here at the bottom the names, but here they all are here. Um, so we're showing the correlation in the top graph in warm and cold phases and the indoor-outdoor ratio. Okay. Uh, first thing to notice here is, generally speaking, the indoor-outdoor correlations are moderately strong. So 0 0.5 uh, up to around 0.65 or 0.68, I think. So fairly high correlations between indoor and outdoor PAHs. Um, and, and also notice here in the second um, graph, indoor-outdoor ratio is close to 1. So both of those findings suggest that a lot of the PAH indoors is from outdoor sources. So now what about hopanes? Again, um, traffic sources from lubricant oils. So here we see, um, in this case, a little bit higher um, outdoor concentrations than, than indoor concentrations. Um, not, not hugely higher. Um, yeah, fairly similar concentrations in, 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 both, in both seasons, maybe a little bit higher in, in the cool season. And looking at correlations, again, like PAHs, very strong correlations between indoor and outdoor, moderately strong, I would say, around 0.5 to uh, uh, more than 0.6. And the ratios of indoor to outdoor are close to 1, so approaching 1.0. So again, we would conclude that this, this tracer, which is not generated indoors, for sure. I, don't, I can't think of any hopanes that would be, unless you have a kerosene stove or something inside. It should mostly be generated from outdoor sources. Not even a kerosene. No, no, it's from lubricant oils. No, there's no way. So, so this corroborates really our conclusion uh, for PAHs that, that, that combustion-related uh, aerosols or components from combustion-related aerosols, um, a lot of them are coming indoors, even in the cold season when you'd expect windows to be closed. Okay? So we, th we think this is an important finding. It's not necessarily a brand new finding, but I think it's very, very well uh, demonstrated in this, in this study. So uh, in alki on alkynes, uh, we, we have no um, interest in them as, as, a, as a chemical with health effects, um, but uh, w we know that there are a lot of indoor sources, cooking and, and so forth, uh, other, other indoor combustion sources. Um, so w what we see here um, is, um, concentrations um, that are particularly high in G3 and G4, so Riverside and uh, the G3 is actually the closest community to, to Riverside, but I don't know that this has anything to do with this, uh, higher concentrations in, in the cold phase. So this is a phase when you'd expect windows to be closed, and so indoor concentrations might be higher. So if we look at the correlations, they're all over the place. So there's really no consistent correlation between indoor and outdoor except perhaps for a lot of the, um, a lot of the compounds in the, in the warm phase. That's red here. Um, so we'd kind of expect that uh, with windows being open um, during the warm phase. And in terms of indoor-outdoor ratios, again, just you know, reflecting off the, uh, the correlations, the indoor-outdoor ratios are way bigger than one, you know, up to 12 um, for the cold phase when windows are closed. So this, again, sort of uh, suggests that, um, 
the main source of alkanes is from indoor combustion sources and other sources, can burning and um, cooking and so forth. Um, so organic acids, um, again, another, another, um, another, although a tracer of SOA, another um, tracer of indoor sources. So a lot of indoor sources of organic acids. So here we see, in fact, that the indoor concentrations are higher than outdoor uh, overall, indoor in the blue. Uh, looking, again, looking at the correlations, uh, really low to no correlations at all between indoor and outdoor concentrations. And just, just like the N-alkynes, um, the indoor-outdoor ratios here at the bottom are uh, much greater than one in most of the, um, for most of the compounds and are larger uh, in the cold season. Again, something you'd expect if there are a lot of indoor sources. So, you know, for this reason, basically our interest is, is in outdoor concentrations of pHs and other primary combustion aerosols, rather than these, by their indoor concentrations of these other things that, um, that we're less interested in with regard to health effects. So this, uh, this uh, graph is from the chemical mass balance model. And so what, what it shows, if you see here, uh, mobile sources is the dark blue. Um, so the uh, predominant, or one of the major, I should say, one of the major sources of PM 2.5, this is PM 2.5 in micrograms per cubic meter, is from mobile sources, really across, uh, across most communities, uh, with a few exceptions, and most phases. Um, the, the second most dominant um, source is other water-insoluble organic matter. So other water-insoluble organic matter um, um, be um, water-insoluble would be other primary uh, combustion sources. So perhaps, um, you know, perhaps these indoor combustion sources were represented also by the N-alkanes and to some extent maybe the organic acids, but N-alkanes for sure. Um, uh, things like candle burning and cooking, uh, especially, uh, were the second uh, largest uh, contributor to uh, particularly the indoor. Uh, as you can see, if you look across indoor, this is the light blue on the indoor. This is a good example here where the water, uh, other water insoluble organic matters, actually there's actually more of it in the indoor environment here um, than the mobile sources. Okay, so if you just look at PM 2.5 indoors, it's, it's just going to be a mixture of all these indoor and outdoor sources. Um, so uh, just further, uh, further supporting um, our aims to look at the relationship between particle composition and health outcomes rather than just particle mass. So overall conclusions from uh, task two, indoor pHs and hopanes show moderately strong correlations with outdoor counterparts, with indoor outdoor ratios close to unity. Again, pointing to the strong influence of outdoor sources which in, in this case are mainly vehicular sources in the LA basin. Uh, higher concentrations of N-alkanes and organic acids inside the retirement communities uh, were largely dominated by indoor sources, things like cooking, for example. And our source apportionment results show that mobile sources were a dominant contributor to both indoor and outdoor PM 2.5 at all sites. Although obviously, as you could see, there were many other uh, contributors to indoor sources, making PM 2.5 itself, um, uh, I would conclude, as not a very informative metric. So now let's go on to the epidemiologic task three. So um, the gene expression data for 35 genes um, was um, selected. So the genes were selected a priori, basically from the experimental or toxicological literature, um, and these genes are involved in important pathways that we think are behind cardiovascular responses, as I said. So we took the, PM, the um, accumulation mode uh, PM data from task one to two, combined it with exposure data for the quasi-ultrafine particles that we already had, and other pollutant data, and then looked at associations of gene expression with organic components, um, metals, and uh, other components, as well as particle mass. So this is a list um, of genes. Um, if, if you want to know the names of the, gene, of the genes, I'm going to just use all the abbreviations. A uh, real key gene here highlighted in, in red that we're very, very interested in now, especially after this study, is nuclear factor erythroid 2, P45 related factor 2, or NRF2, or NERF2. 
very key gene. And this, um, this, displays, the, this displays the genes within uh, path, biopathways, the biopathways that, that we're interested in. <clears throat> and as you can see, um, a lot of the biopathways, of course, uh, over, overlap. Um, you can see here NF-kappa B signaling with cytokines overlaps with acute phase response, which overlaps with NERF, uh, NERF-2 mediated oxidative stress response, which of course overlaps with phase one and two metabolism and glutathione metabolism. And then sort of off, off by itself is endogenous uh, RS uh, production like myeloperoxidase. And then we picked, uh, we picked one chemokine down, down here. Uh, like I said, we, um, we picked 35 genes. You know, we could have picked hundreds of genes, but again, just like picking three instead of four communities, it was a cost consideration. Um, so we really had to, we had to, we had to just pick, um, well, we had to just pick um, the most interesting genes. And the way we generated interest, again, was to go to the literature, go to the toxicological literature. Um, so here's, uh, this is a busy slide. I don't want to dwell on this. If you're really interested in, in, in uh, understanding what, what I'm showing here, uh, please see a review article that we did um, in 2011 in Air Quality, Atmosphere, and Health. Uh, this was a review article about uh, measuring oxidative stress as a, as a biomarker. Uh, I just wanted to show here how gene expression um, folds into some of these pathways. You know, so particles are deposited in the lungs, redox active components come off the particles, um, then they're, they're bioactivated and detoxified with phase one and phase two metabolic genes, uh, metabolic proteins, uh, enzymes. And, uh, and all these other pathways basically lead down to an imbalance or in, a balance or imbalance in oxidative stress. So you've got oxidant defense and oxidation going on at the same time. So depending on, you know, depending on the defense mechanisms and you know, what's behind them, um, they may become overwhelmed and you end up with, with an increased level of oxidative stress because your antioxidant uh, defense mechanism is, is uh, overwhelmed or it's not as good in the first place. Now remember this is an elderly population so as you age uh, unfortunately <laughs> your capacity uh, to generate antioxidant enzymes decreases like everything <laughs> over, over time. Um, so that's again why this is a very susceptible population because it's very easy for this o oxidative stress balance to be tipped with smaller concentrations of pro-oxidant chemicals whether it's dietary or air pollution. So again, behind all this is the gene expression. So the first thing that we would expect um, through NF-kappa B, NERF-2, ARE mechanisms, um, and XRE, uh, we would expect gene expression changes. So uh, methods of gene expression measurement. We collected PAX gene uh, RNA tubes, um, sort of in advance of this study. We kind of anticipated this would be something we'd want in the future. So we already had collected the blood. Um, the RNA was then isolated in our lab by a Kaya cube, a uh, robotic workstation. Uh, we then did the gene expression using PCR on a Maldi-Toff mass spec. Um, this was done at immune, immune sciences lab at the David H. Murdoch Research Institute in North Carolina. So uh, we also looked at, in addition to the, the genes that I showed you in the biopathways, uh, we also measured uh, five housekeeping genes uh, and uh, after looking at the expression data for them, we picked three of the most stable genes. These are control genes, so they have to be stable because you have to adjust the genes that you expect to be going up and down with these housekeeping genes. And we use the, the, uh, the stable, the normal, uh, we use the stable concentrations of these um, uh, housekeeping genes to normalize the copy numbers of our genes of interest, of our 35 genes. So then uh, the set, uh, second set of um, uh, gene expression um, data is for cell-specific surface markers. So why did we measure those? Well, one of the things with whole blood gene expression is that you have, obviously, they're coming from white blood cells, mostly from leukocytes. And it could be that from week to week, you have changes in the populations of different leukocytes. OK, um, lymphocytes up one week down the next, neutrophils up one week, down the next. Within a subject, and this is a study of within subject exposure response changes, we don't expect that to change too much. One of the things that we did to control that was to make sure that 
whenever a subject had an infection, we would exclude the observation because infection is going to for sure change your complete blood count. You're going to have uh, more lymphocytes and so forth. Um, so we did not collect repeated com complete blood cell counts with differentials. We did not. We could not. We were drawing too much blood on these people, and we were already basically <laughs> up to the IRB limit. So we, we just couldn't do it. So we wanted a workaround, and we found a workaround in the literature that sounded very promising. Unfortunately, after the pilot study, which was done uh, with this ARB um, contract, we did not find that there was any significant results, either using baseline data from CHAPS-1 or other data from a population of, of asthmatic uh, children uh, where we had some repeated measures and CBC, um, CBCs as well. So that was, uh, that's the way it is. So that it, it's still a limitation uh, of the study. Um, so then after we got the gene expression results, we found that expression levels of five genes listed here were too low for analysis. Okay, some of them actually, we were very interested in like CYP1A1, PON1, and SOD1. Uh, this left 30 genes to analyze in 43 subjects, giving us an actual sample size of 360 person observations per gene, repeated measures. So the analysis was uh, to first, uh, even though we have normalized uh, gene copy numbers, the, distri the distribution, the univariate distribution of gene expression is always log normal. So we have to log transform it. In some cases, uh, it's still not normal, so we have to take one more step, which is auto scaling. <clears throat> we used a linear mixed effect model, uh, or random effects model, if you will. Um, estimating a random subject effect. Um, this is because we have repeated measures in the subject, so the observations are not independent. Autoregressive covariance structure, we adjusted for temperature. And again, as I said, we excluded uh, all weeks with infections. And then we controlled for, for group and season uh, by mean centering the exposures. And all of these methods can be found in pretty much all of our papers. Uh, we've put either in the paper or in supplements. So the associations that I'm going to show you are expressed uh, by interquartile range, basically to standardize uh, the effect estimate across the different, uh, across the different uh, exposures. Okay, so it's the 25th to 75th percentile. And all exposures, uh, all air pollutants were averaged uh, from one to seven days. For simplicity, I'm going to show you the one-day average, the three-day average, the five-day average, and the seven-day average. So here's a summary of results before I show you some of, the, um, some of the figures. We found that primary air pollutants, black carbon, elemental carbon, primary organic carbon, not carbon monoxide, sorry, this is a typo, and NOx, were associated with increased expression of the following genes. NERF2, key gene, increased expression, and NERF2 mediated or linked gene, hemoxygenase 1, NQ01, uh, superoxide dismate, dismutase 2. So these are in the phase 2 or oxidant defense uh, mechanism enzymes. IL-1 beta, which is an uh, inflammatory um, gene. Uh, soluble platelet selectin, uh, which is involved in the activation of platelets. And by the way, we found the protein was activated as well in the previous study uh, and published on that already. So, so now we've also found, we also found that there was increased gene expression along with the increased protein expression. Uh, and CYP1B1, which is a phase one uh, enzyme involved in xenobiotic metabolism. Uh, I have to say, however, uh, even though there were positive associations, a lot of the confidence intervals were wide, came close to 1.0 or were somewhat below 1.0. Um, and we found this to be the case more for indoor than outdoor. In other words, the associations for outdoor um, air pollutants were stronger. Kind of as you would expect, actually. So I'm going to show you the results um, for the outdoor air pollutants. How are we doing on time? Good? Yeah, OK. So this is the, uh, this is the results for the uh, NERF2 gene expression. And as you can see, looking across uh, these pollutants, these are uh, pollutants that were measured, uh, recall, on an hourly basis. So we're able to look across uh, a uh, one through seven day averaging time for elemental carbon, black carbon, primary organic carbon, and NOx. These are all representing uh, primary combustion aerosols. And I think you can appreciate that um, all the way down, uh, the associations are, are positive. Um, not always significant, 
uh, but but close, borderline significant, or just right at uh, right at the uh, uh, 1.0. Hemoxygenase one, basically the same finding again with elemental and black carbon, um, much wider confidence intervals for primary organic carbon, and again positive associations for NOx. Looking down now at NQO1, again, positive associations uh, all the way down. Um, same thing again, um, some of the averaging times did dip below uh, 1.0. Uh, we, we tended to see uh, the, one in, the one and two day uh, average uh, more significant than the uh, five and seven day averages really throughout. SOD gene expression, again, positive, but uh, not too many were statistically significant. In fact, really only just uh, one day primary organic carbon, 1.4. And note the fold changes down here on the bottom. Uh, if, you, if you look back up, they're not huge fold changes. So, you know, none of the fold changes are, you know, that high. So they're mostly all below two, really between 1.2 and 1.4. So these are low fold changes that we're detecting. Uh, IO1B, um, some positive effects, mostly from NOx, so NOx seems to be uh, the most, most informative. Oh, sensitive. The most informative um, gene, the most informative exposure for this gene, IO1B. And soluble platelet selectin, again, uh, all positive, uh, some significant, some not. Um, so now looking at particle uh, mass and composition using, the again, the five-day composites for the composition and the daily particle mass. And we're comparing the two by just doing a five-day average of particle mass. So we found that uh, the quasi-ultrafine in vitro ROS was positively associated with the expression of uh, NERF2, NQO1, and CYP1B1. Whereas uh, the accumulation mode ROS was only associated with CYP1B1. So overall, we found stronger associations for the quasi-ultrafine PAH and or ROS um, than for the accumulation mode PAH or ROS. <clears throat> and in a side finding, we found that PM from biomass burning, okay, attributed to biomass burning, was positively and significantly associated with HEMOX1 and positively, but not significantly associated with the expression of other genes that we didn't see um, in, in, in the findings for the primary combustion aerosols. So we, including myeloperoxidase and, uh, um, and some of these uh, ATF genes. Um, so we don't know if it's something unique about biomass burning or just a spurious finding. But it is interesting anyway that, that we did see that. And I'm not gonna show the results for that. So here are the results for the uh, uh, PM uh, mass and components. Um, so we see that um, really not much with PM mass for NERF2 gene expression, uh, but we do see some, some positivity for uh, the quasi-ultrafine PAH. Keeps, I, shouldn't, I should have a pointer instead of trying to use this. Um, we see a, a positive association for the uh, PM 0.25 macrophage ROS. Uh, we do see associations for NERF2 with the accumulation mode PAH, but nothing for the ROS accumulation mode. HEMOX1, uh, again, uh, not a lot for particle mass. A little bit of positive association, uh, not all significant for uh, quasi-ultrafine PAH and ROS, and the same with accumulation mode PAH. Um, looking at NQO1, again, you know, a, a little bit of hint from quasi-ultrafine on the mass fr uh, fraction, um, but we're seeing a, more of an association with PM0.25 PAH, as well as accumulation mode PAH. Uh, SOD, um, I want you to just sort, sort of appreciate the trend here rather than the statistical significance because they're all trending positive. Um, and, uh, and with the PAH, that is, is providing consistency with the other uh, pollutant measurements of primary organic aerosols. So SOD, same, same thing. CYP1B1, again, a lot of positive associations, uh, particularly for a PAH. And IL-1B, IL-1 beta, IL-1B. 
Uh, and this is cell P. Again, I think you're going to appreciate for both uh, IL-1B and cell P, so inflammatory platelet activation, that it's the uh, quasi-ultrafine PAH uh, that seemed to be positively associated with, with gene expression and not the accumulation mode PAH. Summary of results not shown. Um, again, the models of the indoor air pollutant uh, exposure data was largely consistent with our findings for the outdoor data. There were a few to no associations for any of the markers of secondary organic aerosols. Okay, that includes the aliphatic acids and aliphatic acids, the uh, CMB estimated SOA, and the secondary organic carbon. Same with ozone. And uh, interestingly, nothing with particle number either. There were no associations for any of the metals, total organic carbon, or carbon monoxide. And then there were no associations for a total of 15 genes. So these genes that weren't associated with basically all in the study pathways. Uh, this slide here um, shows, first of all, crossing out the genes that didn't have sufficient expression level and highlighting the genes that, that seemed to be showing uh, positive associations. Okay, so cell P, IO1 beta, NERF2, hemoxygenase 1, SOD2, NQ01, and CYP1B1. So discussion. So the key strength of this study is the chemical speciation work that was done on the organic components and the exposure analysis and source apportionment for both indoor and outdoor um, particles. So it really helped us a lot in the epidemiologic analysis. We had much better characterized data than, than just using, for instance, particle mass or gas, uh, uh, gas data. And we think that the gene expression data has provided clues to mechanisms that might be responsible for what we'd already observed which were very consistent and significant association with protein expression in the same subjects in this population. And that includes associations for both protein expression and gene expression for uh, ultrafine, quasi-ultrafine particle mass and quasi-ultrafine uh, particle in vitro ROS, this PM oxidative potential <clears throat> as well as significant associations for bo on both the protein expression and gene expression side for primary organic aerosols, but not secondary organic aerosols. As an aside, in a, in a paper we published in Epidemiology, we did find that ozone and secondary organic aerosols were associated with an airway response, which was uh, a biomarker of airway inflammation, exhaled nitric oxide, almost kind of as you'd expect because these aerosols are already pro-oxidant and are expected to have an effect in the airways. So the findings are biologically plausible and it's backed by experimental evidence because we picked the genes from, from the toxicologic literature. Limitations. Well, okay, so a lot of these findings could be false positives, uh, admittedly. And as I say in the second bullet, a lot of confidence intervals were wide and included one. So, you know, so it's very hard to adjust for multiple testing. We did it anyway. Uh, we, we did do a comparison of observed to expected wall statistics at the 0.05 level ended up with no p-values that were significant. Um, that was not surprising at all. Um, so, you know, behind that, of course, is a relatively small subject number, 43, although we did have a lot of repeated measures. So it was uh, 300 and something repeated measures. And I think, I think that still um, supported the method because it did, I think, allow us to detect some effects at relatively low fold changes. Um, given that uh, this is an elderly population um, from the table that I, that I probably glossed over, this is mostly a, a white on Hispanic population, uh, all elderly, all retired. So there's limited generalizability. So we can't generalize to minority groups. We can't generalize to healthy young people and so forth. We also didn't measure everything, uh, nor could we. Things like diet, dietary changes from week to week. Uh, we, did change, we did control for seasonality. We controlled for retirement community and so forth. But there still could be individual differences in, in different behavioral and lifestyle factors that could be uh, driving changes in gene expression that we couldn't control for. So in conclusion, um, we conclude that traffic-related air pollutants are associated with increased whole blood gene expression for genes involved in inflammatory coagulation, and NERF-2-mediated oxidative stress responses. 
Um, and the findings are linked, uh, basically linked uh, across phase one and phase two enzymes because their regulation is linked. That is the xenobiotic response element in the promoter region of both NERF2 and xenobiotic metabolizing uh, enzymes, which is represented in our study by CYP1B1, are activated by aryl hydrocarbon receptor inducers like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, so that's what we think is going on. Uh, we can make those inferences in an epidemiologic study. Obviously, they need to be taken back to the lab and tested in an experimental setting. So for future research, um, I think the conclusion would be we need a larger sample size. So we have one. So in, this, in the competitive renewal of the CHAPS study, we're calling it CHAPS 2, uh, we've just completed follow-up uh, last, this last February, and we have over 100 subjects and we have uh, over uh, 800 repeated measurements. Um, this time, we're gonna do microarrays. So this will be genome-wide gene expression. Uh, right now, we're looking at uh, something over 40,000 genes in the microarrays that we're doing. We just sent out, uh, again, using PAX gene uh, RNA tubes. We just sent out um, last week all of the PAX gene tubes um, for, uh, for assay at Kyogen. And we're hoping to get that data back in a couple of months and begin to work on it over the next few years. And that way we can uh, examine the consistency of the results for this study, not only for the specific genes, but, but more importantly for the biopathways. What we're going to do in the new study is actually uh, we have hypothesized, rather than a usual microarray where you just you know, do the microarray and then see which genes light up. Sure, that's useful. Um, but, it's, but it's really better to have a hypothesis testing approach. So we're going to start with the hypothesis based on, on a series of different genes and specific biopathways that we will look at in clusters. Just like we did in this study, in a way, uh, only with a lot more genes. Okay, so we'll have more of an opportunity to see whether, uh, whether these biopathways that we've seen um, that seem to have been uh, uh, activated in, in this study um, are, again, uh, observed in this new study. The new study is a population, a general population of elderly individuals. So all these individuals have a variety of different uh, morbidities. Some of them are healthy, of course. They're healthy elderly people. Some of them have coronary artery disease. Some of them have diabetes. Some of them have respiratory disease. So, so this will be a, a more generalizable population um, as, as well. And it's more diverse. Uh, I just wanted to point out some supplemental findings. I just don't have time to present all the findings from the study right now. Um, but these are really, really wonderful, wonderful findings. Um, so far, one is published. Um, this was conducted uh, by Shireen Whit Whitkop, who's an MD-PhD student, um, going to be defending her thesis soon. Uh, she came up with a very novel finding uh, in this population, uh, published in PLOS One, showing that subjects uh, who are, uh, uh, we, we took the mitochondrial uh, gene and, 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 and assigned haplogroups to, to the subjects, and then we compared haplogroups uh, based on, on, on expected uh, coupling. So subjects in haplogro haplogroup U showed a lower susceptibility to the effects of traffic-related air pollution than haplogroup haplogroup H. And in haplogroup H, haplogroup H is more tightly coupled in terms of the respiratory chain. So the respiratory chain, when it's more tightly coupled, generates more reactive oxygen species. So we'd expect these people to already, a priori, be more susceptible. And we would expect haplogroup U to be less susceptible. And these differences were statistically significant. Uh, so nobody else has shown this before. We know that the mitochondria are, are very important uh, with regard to oxidative stress and with regard to the effects of air pollutants, including uh, a lot of early data from, from several years ago from UCLA and other, and other um, uh, institutions showing effects of ultrafine particles on, on mitochondria, so, you know, really important effects. So, so this, um, this, we think, is, um, is, very, is a very important finding. Um, the other set of findings um, is we looked at uh, gene environment interactions for a number of uh, candidate genes and candidate SNPs with known functional uh, effects and with relatively high allele frequencies. And we did find interactions for, for a number of these. Um, 
and we'll be publishing on that hopefully soon. Um, these are all the investigators in the study, uh, in CHAPS 1, that is. Um, just like to thank all of them. Um, my USC colleagues, uh, Dr. Ciotis uh, is the PI there, uh, Dr. Stamer uh, in our lab, Dr. Longhurst in cardiology, Mike Kleiman, um, the aerosol chemistry group at University of Wisconsin, James Schauer and Martin Schaefer, biostatistician Dan Gillen, and Dr. Vaziri. And I can't thank the students and staff uh, more. Uh, and there are quite, quite a few of them involved in this study. Questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, you found no effect with particle number. Yes. So, um, do you have a comment on that? Yes, I do. Um, so, we did see associations between particle number and some of the plasma proteins. So, therefore, we expected to see this with gene expression as well. So, I, I, don't, I don't know why. What they, in general, I would have to say that uh, all the other findings in the study, all the other outcomes, Particle number sort of had mixed, mixed effects uh, in, in many cases. Well, I think, and, and one of the reasons why we no longer measure particle number in, in the new CHAPS 2, um, not only is it a lot of work to measure using, using CPCs and so forth, but we don't think particle number is that meaningful. And, and the reason is that, you know, we, you know, everybody kind of thinks of particle number, oh, well, it's generated from the point sources. You know, if you go and measure it from the freeway, you get really high concentrations by the freeway. Same with black carbon and CO and NOx. And it goes down as you go away from the freeway. Okay, sure, yes, but particle numbers also go up um, during photochemical events as well. And Dr. Ciotis' group has actually shown that quite clearly before, studies in Claremont and other areas where they had CPCs, you know, at, at great distances from point sources and still saw these huge increases um, uh, during uh, times when ozone was going up, in fact, um, things like that. So, so I think it's like particle mass, in a way. Particle number is like particle mass. It doesn't tell you what the composition is, nor does it necessarily tell you what the sources are. So, so it's a, it's a, it's, to me, it's, it's a similarly crude metric. But, but, but would you think that mass would be a better metric than no, number? No, not really. I do measure, we still measure mass, of course, because it's, yeah. it's EPA regulated, too, and we have to be able to report on PM2.5 and you know, PM10. It's just obligatory. And, and another question, I did see that you saw some associations with NOx. Yes. And I'm wondering, do you think, is that a surrogate for something? Yes, or? I don't think, I don't think, uh, at the concentrations we see, for example, with NO2, um, there are concentrations that, that n seem to never induce any adverse effect in experimental studies of, of humans or, or animals. Um, you, you need a magnitude higher concentration to induce effects, so we think it's a tracer of, of combustion-related aerosols and, and, and gases. And gases, too. You know, we didn't, so we don't, we didn't measure all the <laughs> semivolatile and volatile organic compounds that, that might have an effect. Um, in other parts of the study, did you happen to measure any uh, more clinically oriented endpoints? Well, yeah, all published. Ambulatory uh, endpoints primarily. Uh, we found, um, so we measured, really the first study to measure um, um, in this way, uh, ambulatory blood pressure on an hourly scale over a 10-day period. Um, we found increased, both increased systolic and diastolic blood pressure in relation to um, mostly primary combustion, uh, markers of primary combustion aerosols and NOx. Um, and these effects were actually quite clinically significant. I mean, up to uh, 8 millimeters uh, to, to more than 10 millimeters of mercury for systolic. And uh, I think four to six millimeters of mercury for diastolic per interquartile increase in, in the air pollutant. These are clinically significant increases for anything, really, to be able to detect that. And I think it was because of the enormous statistical power of the repeated measures that we had. We also had the subjects where uh, 
uh, electrocardiographic uh, monitor, a Holter monitor. Um, I mean, they were just like Christmas trees. You know? <laughs> they had all this equipment they carried around with them for two five-day periods. And we were able to, with that, with the Holter monitor data, uh, to capture EKG, of course, and then be able to see ST segment depression of one millimeter, which is, which is used as a potential indicator of cardiac ischemia from, from whatever cause. And we did find that to be significantly associated with, um, with again, with primarily primary combustion aerosols and gases. Um, and we found an increase um, in the probability of ventricular arrhythmias uh, using, using that data as well. That was uh, the heart rate variability study that, that ARB funded. We didn't find anything with heart rate variability, though, as you recall. I really enjoy your talk, especially in terms of multidimensional uh -huh. part of your project. I have one quick question about your subject. In a way, there are older subjects uh -huh. with these, some pre-existing conditions. Yes. So if there are something, there are more predisposition to see some outcomes, right? So in that's the thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why you pick this. Yes, exactly. And so the next stage, you are going to have more broader, so could there be more variant in terms of exposure and also health outcomes? Well, yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm, not, sh I'm, not, necess I'm not sure necessarily that because these uh, people had a diagnosis of coronary artery disease, that necessarily made them tremendously more susceptible per se, maybe they're more genetically susceptible because you might be developing uh, you know, uh, atherosclerosis because of dietary preferences. And remember, you know, you know, almost half of these people had heart attacks. Right. A lot of them had, had you know, coronary artery bypass grafts. I mean, when you go through this, you start to think, you know, what am I doing? What did I do wrong? And people, you know, we've talked to these people. I, you know, I've, I've interacted with all of the, all the subjects, went out in the field, interacted with all of them. And, Staff had day-to-day -day contact with, with them. So we know that they were, you know, generally very cognizant of, of their health. The ones that participate usually, you know, this is kind of a recruitment bias. They're more interested in health, thing, health anyway, so they're more interested in our work. So, you know, they're probably going to have better diet than most people. So in a way, in a way when you think about it, um, as an elderly population, they might actually be less susceptible than your general American population that, that's not eating well and, you know, stuff like that. They don't smoke either, so they're non-smoke. So they don't have a lot of the other risk factors that other people might have. We don't, we don't want those to actually um, essentially muck up our findings. I see. And also another general question. So you are looking at the gene level. At what? Gene, 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 gene level of outcomes, right? Yeah. In terms of public health overall. Yeah. So what's the relevance of doing this study in the, this minor, minor scale? in terms of the air pollution. So you want to do something proving biological pathway? That's we don't, we, you know, in epidemiology, we don't really prove anything. That's, right. that's up to the experimental um, toxicologist uh, to doing experimental work to, 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 to prove mechanisms. In, in epidemiology, we're able to provide evidence that those mechanisms could be operating in humans. In other words, that's why we went from the toxicological literature showing all this gene expression work and saying, okay, that's wonderful, that's great. Can we see this in, in humans as well? And then, you know, then we can again throw it back to the experimental work to, to, to then tie this all together again. So, so I think it's a, it's, a back and, it's a back and forth. So it's important to know what the mechanisms are because then, you know, then you know, potentially we can better understand what these air pollutants are actually doing to people. And if we, if we know what, for, for example, we know, we, we know about all the bio, bio pathways, we don't know everything, but we know a lot about the bio pathways that are driving cardiovascular disease, regardless of the cause, regardless of the etiology, whether it's smoking or diet or air pollution. So if we can show that air pollution is, is feeding into these same pathways that's, that cigarette smoking and and bad diets and, and other unhealthy lifestyles are, um, you know, then it's, it's, it's another risk factor. Mm -hmm. And it's a risk factor uh, for some of the same reasons. Yeah. Okay. I can um, read it. It's uh, Jamie from DTSC uh, questioning. You mentioned some findings of 
genetic environmental interactions, but did not describe the magnitude or significance of these interactions. Were these uh, gene environment more significant than the associations of RNA expressions with pollutant levels in the general populations? Well, I, the reason I didn't is that it's, it's, a, it's a very, very, very long story. But to make a long story short, yes, in some cases, the, we looked at both protein expression and gene expression. So in, in some cases, we did see that, um, that subjects with certain stents, just like I, I discussed for the, the mitochondrial haplotype group, some of the associations did become stronger and more significant. Okay. Would correcting for this gene uh, environmental interaction reflect uh, results in increased significance of the content? Perhaps. Perhaps. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have a naive question. Uh, after seeing that you show that uh, whatever the season and whatever the location, um, the pollution outside and inside were about the same. Does it really make sense to say we have a bad pollution, stay inside? I mean, you hear that on the radio, you know, regularly. Yeah. Am I missing something? Or? Do, do we have bad pollution indoors? Well, I mean, what I I mean, it, when there's some events, uh, there's been some in the winter around here, yes. and they recommend that people stay, stay indoors. Inside. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it seems to me that you just shown that it's. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it depends on, you know, a lot of times, <clears throat> yes, a lot of times uh, those recommendations are, are targeted um, for people with respiratory outcomes in particular. You know, for example, you know, larger particles are important for asthma, coarse particles. So certainly you're going to see if there's, if there's, you know, a dust storm or there's a wildfire. Uh, or there's a lot of, you know, photochemistry going on. It's, you know, really, really hot, and there's a lot of ozone. Coming indoors would help. There's going to be lower ozone levels, um, lower concentrations of larger particles. So here we're really seeing, a, 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 you know, a lot of this um, coming from, you know, smaller fine particles, quasi-ultrafine particles related to combustion aerosols. So it's, it's usually most of those recommendations have to do with wildfires and other other kind of events um, to stay indoors. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dahl, for, for your nice presentation. And thank you, everybody in the audience, for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Right. Yep. A lot of work. Yeah, this is a lot of work. I mean, I couldn't do the G by E stuff.